what's happening, I, uh, I busted out my absolute best shirt for this event. Uh, this is again my four-year-old blue t-shirt that, I don't know, maybe you can see through it at this point. It's getting thin. It's slowly starting to fade. So, uh, there is no rhyme or reason to this. I have literally three pages of questions, which obviously I'm not going to get to all of these, but uh, I wanted to get through some of them and, uh, and see. But remember, I'm one person with one opinion. I appreciate everybody who sent questions in. It is a rainy day here in Maine, uh, incredibly humid. It feels like I'm still in the shower from this morning. Got up early, did some released a film today. What's it called? Uh, Photo Fitness. It's the first in a series, which should be a fun series, actually, to keep producing. And uh, that leads me to my first question. It's going to be a weird one, I think. Got my trusty laptop. It still works. By the way, the watch is still working. Something odd happened. No big surprise there. God, I'm starting to sweat. It's like super hot in here. Muggy. Something odd happened. The date window, everything was just smooth sailing. Everything was going fine, dandy even. And uh, all of a sudden, it was August 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then the 7th came along, and it didn't, just, it didn't change. It didn't go to the 8th. So I set it to the 8th, and then it started changing at noon instead of midnight. And I don't know why I didn't do anything to it. It just started. Could this be the beginnings of the death rattle? I don't think so. The watch itself is still working. And at this point, hang on, hang on. We gotta do a little maintenance, a little lawn, lawn maintenance here. I think it, it should be okay at this point. Let's get to the first question. Actually, no, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna get the air conditioning thing on. I haven't used the air conditioning pretty much all summer, but I'm about to turn it on now because I am glazed. I am glazed. My mother would say, I don't sweat, I perspire, as my dad would eat dinner with a towel around his neck because he would leave a puddle. When he played tennis, yeah, I come from an aristocratic a-hole family who played tennis. Uh, he would leave squeegee marks on the court with his shoes. He sweats so much. Hang on, I'll be back. All right, you're going to have to suffer with the sound of the air conditioner in the background, but I don't really care. I've got some good, funny tennis stories. We have a family portrait of the five of us at some sort of tennis. It's not a, I can't, I can't go as far as to call it an academy. It was like a resort that you would go to that was centered around tennis. And I look like I'm crazed. I look like Emil Minty, the feral kid in Road Warrior. I mean, I just look like they plucked me out of the outback and stuck me in there. My brother looks miserable. My sister looks miserable. My parents look miserable. And we're all wearing short shorts because this was like the early 80s. And uh, it's just god awful. I played tennis in high school and then I played with members of a college team, but I was not on the college team because the college team recruited all their players from overseas and I was just a low, lowly yokel joker, but I played with those guys a lot. And I had one strategy in tennis that I would call a master stroke. I would call it a masterpiece. It's a Renoir of how I played the game, which was by the time I started playing tennis, nobody was serving and volleying. Everybody was playing from the baseline. I got bored playing from the baseline, so I would serve and volley. But the first thing I would do to any player who didn't serve and volley was I would drop shot them, bring them into the net, and then try to hit them as hard as humanly possible, just to put the fear of God in them. And let's face it, tennis players are not exactly tough. They're not tough people. It's not like I would do that to an MMA 160 pound. I could probably drop I was thinking about this the other day. I could probably, I could do 155 easy, but that's a horrible division for me to go in. I would have not, I would have very limited success. I would have to go down to 145, which I think I could do, but I'd still get my ass kicked. But let's get on with the questions already. Quit talking about this useless crap. So, number, question number one. What is the next step for you? That is a great question. I don't know who asked that, but um, I get asked that question on a fairly regular basis because I'm constantly doing new things and trying new things and I'm looking way down, you know, I'm booked, uh, I'm booking into late next year in terms of trips and travel and that kind of thing. So my schedule's pretty, pretty filled and people are always like, what are you going to do? I have a couple of ideas. One of these I've hinted about on here before. I'm still working on that plan. In fact, I was doing little schematics this morning as to how that would look visually online. And I've hinted about <clears throat> subscription model, 
starting my email newsletter, combining those two things before. I've got experimental print projects I'm working on. I'm kind of pondering the idea of using my email newsletter, which is about almost 2,000 people have signed up, believe it or not, to a newsletter I've never sent. So for you 2,000 people, uh, bear with me. I'll get there. I just want to make sure that what goes in that newsletter, when you get it, you're going to say like, wow, I can't believe I'm getting this in the newsletter. That's what I'm working on. I want to use that email newsletter and say to the 2,000 people, I'm going to print 200 copies of a book, a photo-related book. It is not going to be a portfolio book. It would be more of a either photo with story book or a, or a sort of, not a how-to book, a weird amalgam of aspects of photography in a book. It would be small, preferably six by nine, seven by 10, somewhere around there. Uh, soft cover, maybe with a flexi cover, something in the middle of a hard cover and a soft cover. I don't want the price to be crazy. I don't want it to be a precious object. I want it to be a book that travels. But I would only print about 200 copies. So I would go out to those 2,000 people and say, there's only gonna be 2, 200 copies, who wants one? Just to gauge, and, I, and the reason I'm doing this is not because I wanna do a book. It's, I'm doing it because I need to show other people how to do this. I believe that that model is the future of publishing. I don't think the future of photo book publishing is going to traditional publishers. I think that model is broken and flawed and it's been that way for a long time. Not to say there aren't great books being made. There are, and there's amazing photo book publishers. A friend in Santa Fe just got a new book and it looks spectacular. So, But that's a model that I have no interest in. I'm never gonna spend tens of thousands of dollars up front to, to get a book from a publisher that just doesn't interest me at all. I've had the opportunity three times in my career and I've said no every single time. The other thing is, and I was thinking about this a lot for the last couple of days. This would maybe be the second part of the first question, which was, what's next for you? I had written down here somehow when I wrote that, this question's from a long time ago, by the way, was get a clear runway. And one of the things that's a little challenging for me right now is historically my role at Blurb has been, uh, has been, what I, it's, it's a bad expression, but the public face of Blurb. Obviously, I'm not the founder. Eileen Gittens was the founder. But between the two of us, Eileen and myself, we've probably done more public events at Blurb than anyone in the company. I can almost guarantee that. And frankly, I might have done more than Eileen at this point. So I travel the world and I do workshops and panels and lectures and classes and talks and I do a ton of writing and I do all this stuff for Blurb. But the public events that we were doing prior to COVID have not come back. And I don't really see us ever doing events like that again, where I might fly to Australia and go to Brisbane for five days and do five events, then go to Melbourne and do five days and five events, then Sydney and five days and five events. The same thing could be said for Europe. The same thing could be said for Canada. The same thing could be said for the US. We don't, we're not really built for that anymore. But at the same time, it makes more sense for me to be in the field than it does for me to be sitting at a laptop at my house. So I'm thinking of pitching them on a new idea of what my job could be that would combine my own events that I'm manufacturing on my own that also tie to Blurb. For example, all of my workshops, because they are, we're building books and magazines in real time as we go, those are all Blurb related. I just got asked to do another workshop in Southern Europe. I got another, uh, asked to do a workshop in Norway. I've got Lebanon and Jordan coming up in the spring. I've got Peru next month. But there's also a lot more going on. And from what, the way I look at it is if I'm flying to Europe to do a workshop, why would I not stay in Europe and do blurb specific events while I'm there? Which would be France, UK, Germany primarily, Netherlands as well. Why would I not do that? So I'm kind of thinking about like I need to be... There's no reason for me not to do that because it doesn't matter where I'm sitting at my laptop. I'm accomplishing all the things that the company is asking for me and quite a bit more because all of this other stuff that I'm doing, the workshops, the YouTube channel, my shifter site, AG23, no one's asking me to do that. That's all self-generated. So I need to combine all of these things, but I need a little bit more freedom to do that. I need, I need my boss to say, and, I, and, and they may do this, they may not even bat an eye, they may just say go, or they're gonna say, well, we're not really sure how this is gonna work because who's gonna pay for all the travel and all that stuff. So I would probably have to pay for a good percentage of the travel, which I'm totally willing to do because it's gonna allow me the opportunity to produce more of the kind of content that I wanna produce, which is a little bit like the film I released today, the, the um, what the hell is it called? 
photo fitness. That's it, which will probably get no views at all, by the way. Brad, I just need, I need you to find me 20,000 likes. Yeah, this whole YouTube popularity thing was stolen from me because Lindsay and um, who else, what is, uh, what's his face, the crazy, Rudy with the hair dye, they told me it was stolen. So I just need 20,000 likes on, on YouTube. Figure it out. Yeah, so another day, another indictment. This is pretty crazy. This one, by the way, today, 18 or 19 other people going down with the ship, with the Trump ship. Wow. It, you know, at this point, he's been indicted so many times. My question is really, what, what crime didn't he commit? Is he the Boston Strangler? It's, it's possible. Did he kill Bigfoot? Most likely. It, there's just no, nothing stopping this. It's pretty crazy. And what it will it all mean in the long run? Probably nothing. If you're wealthy and you're white and you're a former president, it's going to be really, really hard to penalize that person. Think about it. This is all my, all my crazy lefty friends are like, he's going down. He's going to be in an orange jumpsuit breaking rocks by the highway. Chain gang, you know, with the guys horseback, cool hand Luke, shotguns, all that. Problem is, how do you put a president in prison? Because he's got Secret Service protection for life. So do, do the Secret Service guys have to go to prison too? That would suck. Hey, Billy, we've got a promotion for you. It's going to be great. Three square meals a day, companionship. You're going to prison. You're going to Rikers, baby. I don't see it happening. We're just not built. Our system is so fundamentally flawed across the board. And I mean not only our political system, the judicial system, and the law enforcement system. Oh, by the way, and I know I'm a slightly off track here, but this is worth it. I spent four hours, I spent from 8 p.m. to midnight talking with a law enforcement official yesterday. Holy crap what this guy shared with me, which I'm not going to share right now at this second. I need to figure out a better way to do this. I will probably write about it on my site. This dude peeled my head back about the inner workings of law enforcement in the northeastern part of the United States. And let me just say this, it ain't pretty. It's a million times worse than you think it is. According to this guy who's had a 25 year career, um, it's, I knew it was bad. And, and not to say that all cops and all law enforcement are bad, obviously not. There's a ton of great people out there and they're you know oftentimes underpaid, undertrained. You gotta buy your own ammunition. You gotta do all kinds of stuff for training purposes that is. So there's a lot of improvements we need to make with education-wise with law enforcement. Um, and But I was like, whoa. He told me some things I just simply did not know. And it was pretty grim. Grim, which is one of my all-time favorite words. Grim was a word used by Hunter Thompson so eloquently and so strategically. That's how I learned my appreciation for the word grim, was Hunter, Dr. Hunter S. Thompson. And if you don't know him, I'm going to hook kick you in the head the second I see you. Question number two. If you could work on any story, what would it be? Oh, for sweet crap and Jesus. How, how am I supposed to narrow down one story? Farming and ranching would be interesting to me because there's less than 2% of Americans involved in that industry. I grew up in part on a cattle ranch. I find ranching and farming to be wholly misunderstood by the American population. We've got multiple generations of people now who have grown up with absolutely no connection to the land. Their only connection to the land is through screens. So that's a story that could be told really well and really break outside the confines of the cheesy farming and ranching stories that the media is so prone to tell. That is such a tired horse, no pun intended. I don't want to see that story ever again. Um, you know, cowboys wear tennis shoes when they're irrigating. They don't wear cowboy boots and a big hat and chaps and, and act like they are, you know, on these TV shows. I would love to do farming and ranching. I would love to do Afghanistan. Uh, there's a zillion stories. I would go to Afghanistan tomorrow if I got a chance to go there, even though the danger level is certainly high. Um, I don't think that Mr. Taliban would be all too cool with uh, Uncle Dano roaming around, but I would, I've always wanted to go to Afghanistan. Um, the border is endless amount of stories. I love water issues. I love any kind of environmental uh, story now. I'd love to do a story about espionage in some uh, way, shape, or form. Port cities, bike touring, bicycle touring, uh, and actually motorcycle touring would be kind of fun too. I would, and, and this would combine this, which is um, any human I find interesting enough to totally embed with, like Frances McDormand. How about that? I could start with her, you know? maybe embed with uh, Franny for a while and um, I don't know, just see what happens. A river story 
source to see would be a lot of fun and I would really love to do that on a motorcycle, which by the way, I have a new motorcycle coming. I'm not gonna tell you what it is yet. You're gonna have to wait. You're gonna have to show me that you have at least a smattering of patience. Otherwise, I'm gonna cut you off. I'm gonna reach across and turn this off right now. I would love to do the Yangtze in China from Tibet, the Tibetan Plateau to Shanghai. And I would love to do that on my motorcycle and that will never ever happen because think about this. This is, you want a little sobering reality here, 54. I'm officially, as a kid, I looked at life as a mountain, a peak. Let's say K2, because it's freaking dangerous, right? And I just looked at it, 50 was the peak, and then once you hit 50, it was downhill, and I had kind of had a 100 circle down there, like, dream on, I'm, I'm never gonna make it to 100. But I was like, okay, so I'm already, I've already summited. I'm coming down the backside, which is even way more dangerous than the front side. So I'm 54, I have a job, uh, I've got responsibilities. There's no way I'm gonna get the time to do that. I'm trying to get my motorcycle to China. I guess I can rent one over there, buy one over there, try to do it logistically. Am I gonna pull that off? Odds are, absolutely not. But I can dream about doing it. And the reason I chose that was probably because I'm reading The River at the Center of the World, A Journey Up the Yangtze and Back in Chinese Time by Simon Winchester. This a-hole can write. This is an unbelievable book. I just rechecked it out earlier, early this morning because I, it's just a gold mine of information. And I figured out another way to read. Left to right actually works a lot better than the other way. I just figured that out. But it's taking notes and everything. This book's a gold mine. And this book makes me want to get on a plane right now and go to China. And all the horrible things he says about China which he says, he tells you about the horrible things, but then tells you why it's interesting and endearing, which I love, because I've been to China once, and I remember taking a meter reading. I was in Guangzhou, and I took a meter reading in the middle of the day, and I was shooting Fuji Chrome 100, which direct sunlight anywhere in the world is 250 f8.5. That's your exposure. That's your starting point, so if you lose your meter, or your meter in the camera breaks, that's your starting point. You can always manipulate from there. And I kept taking this meter reading and it was like two stops off. I was like, what, what is going on? And I'm sitting there fumbling and my friend who lived in China said, what's the problem? And I said, my meter broke. I'm getting like 250 at F4. He goes, no, it's pollution. It was two stop smog filter. And I was like, whoa. And at the end of the day, I was just coated in black, which I don't care. I still want to go to China and I would love to do that. Okay, question number three, what hard drives do you take into the field? These tiny SanDisk SSD, two terabyte, um, pro portable SSD, two terabytes. I take two of these. So Lightroom catalog is on one and I have, I back up the images on, so I have two, two drives, two sets of images and the third set of images remains on my laptop until I get home. And so I've got three copies of everything while I'm in the field. If I had something like Photo Shelter, which like an idiot I had for years and I got rid of it. I had Blurb's entire visual history on Photo Shelter. And then Blurb was, we had so many regime changes and they were like, I don't really care. So I was like, why, why am I doing this? And so I got rid of it and now I really wish I had it again. Um, I would do a fourth copy in the cloud um, as I was in the field if I had internet. And a lot of the places I go, there's not fast enough internet to upload not even high-res JPEGs, it wouldn't, they wouldn't work, let alone TIFFs or uh, DNGs or my RAW files. So that's what I take. Question number, let's see, one, two, three, four. What suitcase did you buy and why? You and the, you and the equipment. Hey, look at what I have right here. Is there a front side? Yeah, there is a front side. This thing right here, look at that, look at that bicep. Holy cow, was that Arnold Schwarzenegger? No, just kidding. Mr. Puniverse, as my father used to call me. Uh, this is my MVST. No idea what that stands for. It is my uh, aluminum emerald. It's not really an emerald green. That could be a baby poo green. Could be. It's got some cool features like these handles that just go down slow. Uh, the wheels are amazing. The handle, you know, thing works just fine. It's got a really nice organization on the inside, and it's small. It is tiny. It's a lot smaller than my Away suitcase. It's a little heavier because obviously the aluminum is going to weigh a little more than the plastic Away, although I was happy with the plastic Away, but I think I told this story. I gave it to my wife because she was looking a little hobo-like and needed to upgrade. 
So I bought this thing. I purposely got one smaller than the Away. This is what I would call, this, you know what size this is? This is the size that is defined by Europeans not screaming at me at the airport as I carry this on the plane. Euros are very sensitive. And you Euros, by the way, are it's not, not beyond you to maybe throw a little discrimination towards your American buddies like Uncle Dan here. That's happened more than once. So this is more of like a Euro carry-on size. It's not the ultra Euro, where it's the guy that just has a phone and then he has like the, he has the Zoolander phone and then he has a suitcase that's like the size of a deck of cards. That guy's out there, I'm never gonna be him. But this one is pretty nice. I'm gonna take it to Peru. This is gonna be my one bag, <clears throat> a one sort of closed supply bag that I'm gonna take to Peru. And that's a, I don't know, two and a half week trip with a lot of moving around. The internal organization on the bag is really nice. It also comes with a clear wrap that goes around the bag, which is really pretty nice because if you have to check it, these bags are, aluminum suitcases show wear very quickly. The good news is they tend to hold up really well and that was the point of me buying this. And also you cannot over expand the bag. It's limited by the, what you see is what you get size wise. So not like my wife, she starts out her suitcases like this and then she comes back and it's the size of the door of the van, the sliding van. It's like, like this, it's got an albatross wingspan by the time she's done. So this will be good. Um, I've got a ton of potential travel coming up and this is gonna be the, my suitcase that goes with me. The camera bag will change depending on where I'm going for how long and what my duties are. So if I need to shoot video, it's gonna be one bag. If I need to just shoot stills, it's gonna be another, all those kind of things. The person who asked me what happened to the Tenba Fulton bag, this is a bonus question, if you will. Um, I still have it. I have both of them and those get, will get used as well. Probably both of those will go to Peru. One for me, one for my wife. But hang on, I gotta, my unk's coming in. I gotta, gotta tell him what I'm up to. I'll be back. All righty then, I'm back. How many different cuts am I gonna have on this one film? Remains to be seen. Uh, okay, so that was my suitcase, that's covered. Question number f one, two, three, four, five. Are you happy with the X100V? Yeah, of course, it's tiny, and I have it with me all the time, and I use it all the time. I've been using these cameras for video and for stills, depending on what I'm shooting. The birding stuff is the X-H2 with the 40 megapixels. All my filming's done on the X-H2S. I'm gonna do it right here, an F-Log, and then I have a LUT conversion for F-Log that looks really good, which you'll see, uh, I think I finally figured it out. Converts it back to Rec. 709. I'm actually talking like I know what I'm talking about. I have no idea what that means. Recreation, Rec. Center, Rec and Roll, I have no idea. And why 709 and not 708 or 712? I could, couldn't tell you, don't care. That's the extent of my uh, technical ability right there. And um, yes, the X100V is awesome, but here's the thing. I could potentially be lumped in the photographer category, even though I don't call myself a photographer anymore. I'm not, I don't make my living as a photographer. Whatever the next version of this camera is, I want it. I want it, and I'm telling you, that next version if, I'm, if I guess as to what Fuji would do with that next version, that camera might be the only camera that I would take from then on. Although that's probably not true because if I'm filming and birding and all that stuff, okay, that was a big lie. That was not accurate at all. But I still want whatever the new version is, whenever the new version is out, I want it. And I want it for free and then I want it for three hours and then I can do a long-term review. Good grief. Uh, number six. When do you, this is a really good question, whoever asked it. When do you know when to give up on a project? I don't think there's any, it's project specific and it is your tenacity specific and your willingness to take abuse. Give you an example. I worked on a project for four years. It was a religious based project. That's all I'm gonna tell you. And I was not part of that religion. And by the way, these people who say you can't do, oh, you're not Catholic, you can't do a project on that. Oh, no, no, you can't. You have to question every single motivation you've ever had in your entire life before you could ever do something like that. And then it's paralysis by analysis and then you end up just taking selfies. That's what, that's what there's a portion of our creative world that wants you to believe that. It's not true. 
I was intrigued by this religion and what it would be like to be in this religion and live inside the United States. And so I spent four years. I had great connections. I met uh, the national director of their education program. He loved my story idea. He helped me and facilitated shoots for me all over the country. I shot from New York to California and everywhere in between. Four years. But about two years into the project, I was starting to get the idea that I was never going to get what I would call the A story. I was only at best, best case scenario, wildest dreams, it was only going to be B. Because I was not from the religion, which caused suspicion. And they viewed me as, more than anything else, as a journalist. And the journal journalism in that community has a terrible reputation, and rightly so. They have been misrepresented again and again and again and again through time. And so, even though it was not represented by me, misrepresented by me, I was guilt by association. And four years in, I told a friend who was from that religion, I said, I think I'm done. And he, the second I said it, it was at his house in LA, he goes, he was talking about when he says we, it was he and his wife. He goes, we can't believe you're still working on it. Like we thought you would have quit two years ago. There's no, you're not gonna get it. You're never gonna get this story. There's too much suspicion. You're not from the religion. They look at you as a journalist. We cannot believe you stuck it out this long. So I loved the story. It was fun, the experience I was learning, but I probably should have cut it off earlier. And so if you can live with the B story or the C story or the D story, and a lot of people can, a lot of people don't even know how to tell a story and they're shooting random stuff and, and they're more concerned about like what software they're gonna use after the fact. Those folks can shoot anything and be totally fine with it. But if you are driven to tell long form stories, then you gotta know, baby, how to tell a story, but you've also gotta know when to say when. And if you're not gonna get it, you've either gotta eject or you've got to redirect and try to come from a new direction. So really hard for me to tell you individually. I don't think there is such a thing as an easy story anymore. I think there's so much suspicion towards photography. I do think you're gonna see photography be fully outlawed in public. It's already a problem in places like France and Germany, Canada's next. There's a lot of countries that are gonna make it impossible to make photographs in public. Believe it or not, that's coming. Uh, it's gonna be, stories are gonna get harder and harder to tell. That doesn't mean you don't go and do them. Maybe that, what, it, what that means is they're sweeter when you're done because you have such a sense of accomplishment. Question number seven. If black and white is such an important way to communicate, then why did master painters from Michelangelo to Rembrandt to Cezanne work primarily in color? Well, I don't know. Color's cool. I like color too. I mean, I am a black and white master. So I don't know if this group still exists, but when I worked for Kodak Professional, I worked for Kodak Professional Commercial. There was also a Kodak Professional Portrait Wedding which we called Portrait Weenie, which is unfair, but it's funny. And then there was even like a landscape component, which we called the Rock and Twig People, which is also insulting, but also funny. So I worked for Commercial, which was, Commercial was like the cool, cool kids in town, right? We worked with fashion guys and editorial and automotive and like all the cool genres of photography. And then you had the dorks in the portrait wedding. I can say that because I worked as a photographer in all of those genres. So there was an event, this group, that was in the portrait weenie world that had, they would give each other medals, like, like Olympic sized gold, silver, and bronze medals for like master of lighting, master of ceremony, master of the hook kick, master, and they would, they, these guys would accumulate, like it was like Michael Phelps, they would accumulate this massive rack of medals, which they would wear to their trade show. They would come waltzing in, always always tended to have a vest too. There was a vest and then like Phelps level of medals around their neck. And we would just be like, oi, what are you doing? That's not something you want to do. They were harmless. They were all super nice people. And by the way, very financially successful, more so than the commercial side. Half the commercial people were just facades. They were trying to act cool. The cross-process nitwits in LA shooting film, cross-processing and think they actually had something on their hands. But... The, the portrait wedding weenies were like really successful. And again, I mean the weenie part endearingly. Maybe. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't know why they only worked in, in color. I mean, color, there's no right and wrong here. I think black and white is a great tool, but it is a bit odd because we, most of us, most humans are gonna see in color. And uh, black and white's about form, shadow, and color is about temperature and direction and those kind of things, at least in my opinion. So I don't know why they only did that. I think they would probably look at black and white painting and say, 
What's the matter? Chicken You can't use yellow? I don't know. It's a good question. And I know very little about art history. I got a D in art history in college. And I made a joke, uh, which I stole from Spies Like Us, which, by the way, is one of the all-time best movies in history. Let's take him back to headquarters. Yeah, headquarters. Good move. Good move. I went to the instructor before the final exam and said, will you hold my wallet? There may or may not be $50 in there. And she did not like that at all. Did not go over well. And consequently, I got a D in art history. And she was kind of a pompous jerk anyway. I mean, one of those people who's like, I've been to the Louvre 55 times, and if your life isn't dedicated to wearing a beret and acting miserable, then you're not going to do well in this class. Consequently, I got a D. To which, to my parents, neither of whom graduated from college, they were like, whoa, how did you get a D? That's amazing. Okay, um... Question eight, what book are you working on now? I have multiple books in production at all times. I do not do photographs that are not intended to be in print form, whether that means a singular print or in book form, primarily books. That's my thing. I love books. I love magazines. I love everything about it. I love what it makes you do as a photographer. Books I'm working on. I have a birding book. I have like a birding lay flat portfolio book of like just beautiful bird images. And I'm making that because I need to do another test lay flat book. And that's the perfect fodder, the perfect subject matter for a lay flat book. I'm also got a project called 33 and Counting, which also incorporates birds, but that's more of a reportage documentary project. And that's going to take several years to work on. What else have I got here? Uh, I'm going to be working on a Peru journal when I'm down there. Let's see. Uh, I don't know. Pixel pushing is for losers and showmen. How you like that? How you like that statement? So yeah, I always got multiple books. I just mocked up a fake one this morning. My Albania journal is right there. Heck, I'll show it to you. Everybody that looks at this thing just goes, whoa, whoa, what is that? What is that? How did you do that? What is going on? I hacked the software to do this. Yeah, that was a nice little move of mine. The old dictator's pad. Hosha's house and... So anyway, you get the idea. You get the idea. Always have tons of books. All right, what are we talking here? How much time? I think I'm about to wrap this up. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, let's just uh, end there. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, let's end with this. What's the best... Meryl Streep movie. Because remember, this whole thing started with, I think, Kevin Costner, and then it was Francis McDormand, and then I, I should have known that one of you guys, one of you people, would have come to me and said, all right, man, well, you did those two. What about Meryl Streep? Pretty easy. Pretty easy. Streep is like a... She's batting, almost batting a thousand. She's a five-tool actor, actress. She can bat for power. She can hit for percentage. She can field. She's got a great arm. She can steal bases. She's good. She is good. Pine tar or no pine tar. Remember the days when they used to have giant chaws in their mouth all the time? They'd be in the batter's box like, and it'd just be this like six inch rope of tobacco juice and like the manager's in there just like nicotined out of his skull. I miss those days. I miss that. There's nothing that screams baseball more than nicotine. So Meryl Streep movies, the best. Let's start with number three, Out of Africa. One, that story, I love the story out of Africa. I thought some of the cinematography, the biplane over the uh, savanna in Africa, that's the classic shot from, from uh, out of Africa. Uh, Redford in his prime, really good. Um, some of the other acting stuff, you know, I don't know. That movie today doesn't necessarily hold up that well. That story does, and Meryl Streep's awesome. So I love out of Africa. Number two, nice little upbeat flick called Silkwood. Uh, I was once inside of a clean room, in a clean suit, in a clean room where they were working with plutonium in test tubes. And anything that was in my possession, had it touched the floor, would have been kept by the facility, including my camera bag, my head, if my head had touched the floor, um, my cameras, anything. Nothing could touch the floor. I'm in a clean suit. took about 45 minutes to get saddled up to get into this thing. So I'm inside here. You start sweating profusely because you're like, wow, I can't really get out of here in a hurry if something goes sideways. And I'm standing there and uh, I hear this clink, and I look down and there's a test tube rolling across the floor. A test tube with like this plutonium, whatever they're working with, the stuff, the, the reason why we're in clean suits, 
this test tube had fallen off of a counter and landed on the stopper and just happenstancely didn't break. And the guy, technician, very casually leans down and picks it up, goes over, puts it back in the test tube holder. And I was like, hey, buddy, hey, old palo over there, um, what would have happened if that broke? And he turned around and he actually did this. He acted like he was holding a hose and he went, Pfft. you ever see Silkwood? Yeah, so that would have been me. Uh, Silkwood's a great story, great movie, amazing performance by uh, Meryl Streep. And finally, this is an easy, this was the easiest question anyone has ever asked because this is one of the classics. Of course, the best movie Meryl Streep has ever been in. It's another little upbeat gem called The Deer Hunter, um, which, by the way, my father let me watch when I was in, like, elementary school. Great parenting there, pod Padre. Uh, yeah, the Russian roulette scene, you know, your, your third grader next to you in the theater. Good job, Dad. Anyway, The Deer Hunter is an amazing film, and uh, she's amazing in that as always. She's never not good, although there's a ton of her movies I haven't seen. So, take it for what it's worth. Okay, that's it. That's the questions we have for this week. I really appreciate it uh, for everybody that sent questions in, and remember, I'm just one guy. So, uh... That's it. I'll be back with a whole bunch of other stuff. I've got two films coming up that I really like, and they are both based on my From the Van with Dan series, which started as a Blurb campaign. Those will eventually be released on Blurb's YouTube channel as well, but I'm asking and working with them to see if I can release them on my channel as well. They are both about um, birding, and one is about an individual who I just interviewed here in Maine, and the other is about the event, The Biggest Week in American Birding, which I did uh, on the drive over on the south shore of Lake Erie. That's probably the best film that I've made to date. And it's the kind of work that I want to do a ton more of, which goes back to the first questions, what's next for you? I got a whole battle plan, baby. I got schematics. I got a battle plan of what the next version of me and everything I'm doing is going to look like. So stay tuned.